on the phone now we have Tor Eklund, who is a Brooklyn-based lawyer representing both uh, Andrew Weave Orenheimer and Matthew Keyes. Uh, thank you for joining us, Tor. A pleasure to be here. Great. Um, so, Tor, let's get started right here with um, with uh, Andrew, uh, who goes by Andrew Orenheimer's case. He goes by uh, by Weave online, I believe. Yes, Weave. And um, let's, yes. let's yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. Let's uh, let's start with um, just what what exactly is he being was he alleged of doing, and uh, what what were they uh, what were DOJ prosecutors charging him with? Um, essentially, he was uh, charged with conspiracy uh, to commit unauthorized access to a protected computer and uh, another count of uh, federal identity theft. And essentially what happened is his co-defendant, Daniel Spitler, who uh, pleaded guilty and, you know, uh, took a plea deal with the government, uh, Daniel Spitler, in I think roughly May of 2010, right when the iPad uh, came out, discovered that if you queried at and iPad email servers uh, with what was essentially a customer ID number. You know, it was a, a SIM card uh, number you know, printed right on the SIM card. Um, if you queried at and servers with that number and it actually matched a, a SIM card number of an actual customer, at and iPad servers would publish a login window. And in that login window would be that customer's address. And then there would be a password prompt where you could enter the uh, password. So Spitler ended up uh, writing a script that basically just counted off numbers, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And if he hit the servers with a, a number that wasn't a customer number, nothing happened. They didn't get kicked off. They didn't get asked for a password or anything. But if they hit an actual, you know, customer number, then that customer's email address was published, and they essentially compiled the, well, Spitler did compile a list of about roughly 114,000 email addresses. And then Andrew uh, Weave took that list and sent it to Gawker after uh, Gawker agreed to, you know, print it and redact it for him. He also sent some emails to some members of the media that he found on the list saying, hey, you know, we just discovered this, you know, thing that at and iPad email servers uh, are doing. And about roughly about a week later, the FBI kicked in his door, guns drawn in Arkansas and arrested him. And uh, we went to trial. There was a guilty verdict on November 20th, 2012, and he's now been sentenced to 41 months in prison and uh, $73,000 in restitution. How, $73,000? Well, yeah, that, that's based on a, the fact that at t sent out a direct mailing to inform all its customers, even though it sent emails to them like a week earlier. Um, uh, and so it's like basically they're, they're trying to stick in with the cost of the uh, at t s direct mailing to its customers. So basically, I, I just want to sort of drive this point home that, um, that, that um, what you're saying is that this, the, what they did basically, uh, we, uh, Weave and uh, his uh, – uh, and Daniel Spitler, basically what they did was they, th this is, was all publicly accessible information. There was no breaking of any sort of uh, security system at AT&T or anything of that sort, correct? Uh, that is absolutely correct. And as a matter of fact, it came out at trial that uh, AT&T had made a conscious business decision to have things set up this way. You know, they knew they could have password protected the email addresses, but they decided for customer convenience that they weren't going to do it. And so essentially, you know, all that's happening here is you've got numbers being entered into a URL, and it's querying a publicly accessible server that AT&T admitted it at trial was available to anybody with an Internet connection, and bang, now you've got a felony. And I think the implications of that are scary, um, you know, for a lot of computer users, because I think if this interpretation of the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is correct, well, then potentially thousands of Americans are committing a, a computer felony every day. Did uh, did did either Weave or uh, or uh, Daniel uh, Spitler did either of them contact AT and T beforehand, or did uh, or on top also additionally did they release the emails the list of emails to the public or just to the the different uh, like I believe it was Gawker who uh, who wrote the original story that they originally gave the information to. Uh, it's my understanding that they didn't contact AT and T. Um, AT and T found out about it from one of its subscribers that Weave emailed. Uh, and remember, it was email addresses. There was no, like, emails downloaded, no, like, private information. This is purely about um, email addresses. And then the only – the list, actually, the list that uh, Andrew supposedly uh, transferred uh, to Gawker was actually never uh, produced at 
trial. I think all the lists got destroyed, and the only person who got the list was Gawker. And I think the theory behind not going to AT&T with these guys was that essentially that, you know, if you go to these corporations and point these things out, they quite often just bury it, and you Mm -hmm. don't get a fix right away. Yes. Whereas AT&T, as soon as they got all this press, had, you know, fixed it really, really fast. Of course, yeah. yeah. After that, yeah. Um, what, did, did AT&T say that um, – did they, did they say that there was any th- sort of a loss on their end, any sort of – I mean, did AT&T want to pursue this? You know, AT&T I don't think is behind this prosecution. There's an email that came out at, you know, trial that we put into evidence where, you know, early on the FBI is contacting AT&T and uh, AT&T's lead – or one of their lead investigators in this matter just says, you know, I don't see a case here. I don't think a crime was committed. You know, you've got a poorly, you know, designed, you know, you know, system. I just don't, I don't see it. I think what is behind this prosecution is really the, you know, the DOJ really wanted to take Andrew out, and you know, they did. Um, I don't think AT&T really was, you know, an aggressive force behind this prosecution. Mm-hmm. I mean. It just seems like they wouldn't want to get any additional press to it. So yeah, yeah, I, I completely could see that. Um, what, what? Um, I just want to jump to uh, to to this past. Uh, I believe it was Monday, the 18th. That's when uh, he was uh, sentenced to the uh, 41 months in prison and ordered to pay the 73,000 in restitution. Um, I, I was reading some of the details that prosecutors were trying to. Some of the details in terms of which the. Uh, prosecutors were trying to portray Weave. Could you go into some detail about that? I thought that was just unbelievably interesting. Well, you know, it's sentencing you're allowed to talk about, you know, the character of the uh, defendant and whatnot. So they just pretty much, I mean, we have the infamous internet troll, and they pretty much went to town on that point. They, you know, were pulling out emails where, you know, that made him look bad, even though it's like you couldn't really I could tell what the context of the email was because they just like pulled it out of his, you know, Gmail account, and 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 they just basically tried to make him, you know, look like the horrible person who's, you know, out to make wreck everyone's lives and make tons of money on the internet, you, you know, with you, you know that kind of hyperbole that quite often a lot of these people in these computer circles talk with, uh, you know, kind of got pulled out of context a little bit, I think, in the courtroom and, and just used to, you know, portray him as this horrible threat to the republic that needs to be locked up for everyone's safety, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was just reading through it, and they used his, he did a I am a on Reddit the night before just to talk about his, uh, his trial, and they, they used that against him because he talked about his regrets of what he did and how he would have done it if he could go back. I mean, just unbelievable stuff. Um, yeah, they, uh, they they monitored him pretty intensely. Uh, you, you, you know, um, I hadn't even I hadn't, I hadn't even watched that Reddit feed yeah. when they were introducing that in court. You, you know, uh, but I think he also knew that. You know, in a certain sense, um, uh, you know, he was a troll to the end there. Yeah. Um, and you know, he just he kept trolling, and, and you know, um, he's an interesting individual, <laughs> say the least. Yes. Um, one yeah. thing, one, one more thing, I want to touch upon that. Not to spend too much time on this, but I, they, I read that they explained the, the term script kidding to try to to try to frame him as a hacker. And to me, that's hilarious because knowing a bit about the hacking community, uh, the term script kitty is usually used as as a derogatory term in the hacking community because it's not really hacking. And on top of that, uh, what what a script kitty basically is, I guess, to, for our listeners, is like it's someone who like uses a, a program to basically you know just that they, they they didn't even create usually to try to just figure out information. Not even breaking into the system. Like for example, they use a, a, a program to just guess random keywords to try to find out what your password is. It's just complete guesswork. And and the fact that he didn't even he didn't even like, for example, he, he didn't even have to guess any passwords, anything like that. The, the the scripting that they used was simply to to quickly gain this publicly accessible information. And it's just unbelievable to me that they even brought this term up, script kitty, as they're trying to call him a hacker when this is such a it's not a hacker at all. Yeah, I think there's a big disconnect, uh, you know, a sort of in in the understanding there on the DOJ's part about what's going on in the in the computer world, in the hacker culture, and you know, I mean, they're trying to win a case, so they're they're trying to portray him as um, some sort of su- super sophisticated hacker, and I think the irony as you're pointing out is that really it wasn't 
any kind of super sophisticated. It wasn't even hacking. Yes. I mean, this wasn't exactly. a hack, you, you know, because a hack, I think, really just it implies that you're, you know, trying to bypass a password or you're changing code or something. Uh, this wasn't even that. This was just a, a public query to a, a publicly accessible server. So what, what's, what's the, uh, the, I guess you can say, what's, what's the, what, where we go from here with this case? What is uh, the next well, step we, for Weave? We're uh, filing our notice of appeal today. We've got a great appellate team, Orrin Kerr, who's uh, I consider to be like the com uh, top computer law scholar in the country. He writes for Law Conspiracy. He literally wrote the computer law case book. He's working on the um, uh, appeal for free pro bono. And actually, I think he will be, will be posting something on the Volok conspiracy later this afternoon, uh, you know, about sort of the, what we, why, why he decided to take the case and the issues that he thinks are important. In it. We've also uh, hooked up with uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. We got Marsha Hoffman and uh, Henny uh, Fakuri over there. So we've got a really good appellate team, and we're going to, uh, you know, appeal this, uh, you know, all the way up the ladder if we can, if we have to. Great. Um, FF, yeah, they're a great, they're a great organization. Um, before we jump to uh, the the Matthew Keys case, I want to quickly just touch upon. I, I was reading through the uh, the uh, I guess you can call it the uh, where was this the um, in the uh, the hear the hearing uh, ruling that came out and the sentencing ruling that came out. I'm sorry. Uh, I read that uh, I was reading through it, and one thing that struck me as very interesting was how uh, you argued how in um, another case that's currently ongoing, uh, Jeremy Hammond's case, Jeremy Hammond is the uh, individual who is being accused of the, uh, the Stratford leaks. And um, the, uh, the judge of that case, Judge Loretta Preska, she was uh, asked to remove herself from the case at, because her husband's uh, email address and those of his clients were part of the, uh, the, Stratford, the Stratford leak. Their, their email addresses were part of the leak. Um, she said that she uh, would not be removing herself from the case because the emails were publicly available information and they did not injure her husband. So, I, I mean, and then you argued that if, if, if she has this, uh, if the court has this, uh, this outlook on these emails, how can they not have the same outlook on these emails in, uh, in determining Weave's uh, offense level? Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, e email addresses because there were it wasn't emails i mean i catch myself saying emails too but i think it's Sorry important about that, to yes. know that it's email addresses you know it's not even it, it's I, I i do it too people do it naturally but it's there was like no substantive content that they got or anyone's communications purely their their email address which i consider to be just like a street address i mean these are things that you use to communicate publicly all the time you're sending them all over the place and i thought you know presco you know had a point there it's like email addresses aren't a big deal you, you know um so, yeah, I mean, that's why we saw that in Hammond's case, and, and we decided to, you know, argue that for sentencing. It's just, it's just amazing. It's just, to me, it's just amazing how hypocritical that is, you know? Um, I guess let's jump yeah, to... Yeah, you got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm continue. sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, continue. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think one of the things is, is like, with this, particularly with the, the second count in Andrew's case, the identity theft statute, 18 uh, U.S.C. 1028-A7, it has such a broad definition of uh, what's a means of identification. It, it, it basically forbids the, what is it, the possession or transfer of a means of identification and furtherance of another crime. And in Andrew's case, the, the, the crime that this was in furtherance was, was count one, the unauthorized access. But it, it's sort of like, again, there's no real harm here, yet you've got these uh, felony penalties um, because of this. And I think the computer statutes here are a little draconian in their penalties when there really isn't any real, you know, harm. 